Stock photography is a type of photography that is generally shot ahead of time and then licensed for various uses by all different types of clients. That sets it apart from the traditionally more typical route of hiring a photographer to shoot something specific and custom tailored for you when you need it. That custom method of getting photos for your advertising campaign or website can be understandably expensive at times, though, requiring the hiring of a photographer, models, space in which to shoot, processing, licensing fees, along with other potential associated costs. Buying the license to use an existing photo, on the other hand, can still have at times a decently large price tag, but will regardless, almost always, still cost a fraction of what having your own shoot will entail. Within the world of stock photography, there are three main pricing tiers, macro stock, mid stock, and micro stock. Macro stock tends to be the higher end luxury segment of the stock photography world. It's generally sold with exclusive rights, so you're not going to buy the license to use a macro stock photo and then see the same photo used on the billboard next to yours. Micro stock is often the cheapest stock photography category, and it's generally so cheap because it's made available in bulk. Photographers offload their extra takes, their experiments, and the thousands of photos they took while on vacation with the understanding that they may make a few hundred dollars at some point for a photo that would have otherwise earned them nothing. It's not their full photo shoot fee, but it is not nothing. Midstock falls between these two categories and is generally either a low-cost, unique, high-end photo or a high-cost, high-quality, but non-exclusive photo. And there are also, notably, photographers that specialize in all different types of stock photography, from the super high-end, unique macro stock to the micro stock, where they will get so sophisticated that they find keywords that are popular with the clients of micro stock companies and go out and shoot more photos that align with those customer needs. Stock photography has been around since the 1920s, and newspapers were early pioneers in this space, selling photos that they paid to have taken to primarily other periodicals for anywhere between 25 cents and a few hundred dollars. Independent photographers began using a similar business model by the middle of the 20th century, and some European photographers fleeing the continent for North America during World War II filled their suitcases with thousands of photos that they'd taken, intending to make their living selling those photos to magazines and advertising companies in their new homes. Stock photography agencies have been around since the Great Depression era, but really took off as an industry in 1945, when the Holton Press Library commissioned the development of a keyword and subject-based classification system that allowed for the indexing and searching of photographs, a system that was later adopted by the British Museum for their collections, but which also allowed stock photography companies to expand their libraries of images massively making it more likely that they'll have what any particular client needs while also being able to serve more types of client and industry and more types of use cases. This also led to the expansion of the royalty-free stock photography market, which had already been percolating earlier, but which became a real force in the latter 20th century with the advent of portable digital media like CD-ROMs, which allowed stock photography companies like Photodisc to distribute CDs with entire stock photo libraries on them. So once a customer paid for the disc, they could use the photos on it as often as they liked. There wasn't any exclusivity, of course, but the market that this opened up because of the far lower overall cost for access to a great many professional photos was a pretty big deal. It made photography accessible to many industries which did not previously have the budgets to afford photos. And this informed what happened in the internet age as stock photography libraries moved online, allowing customers to buy subscriptions that allowed them to use a certain number of photos per month, or in some cases an unlimited number, if they paid the right monthly fee. 
and this alongside the ability to also hire freelance photographers for traditional photo shoots or to buy exclusive images from a library that are unavailable for anyone else after a given image is purchased. One of the innovations that led to the success of the stock photography market was the photographed model release form, a short, often one-sheet contract that grants the photographer permission to publish the photo taken of the signer in a specific or non-specific medium. In some cases, compensation is detailed on the form. In some cases, it's not. In either case, though, such a release needs to be signed by everyone in the photo, or that photo cannot be used, except in specific cases where the photo is newsworthy or when the photo is taken of a public figure in a public place, unless that photo is intended for some kind of commercial use, that is, like slapping that public figure's face on a billboard advertising breath mints or something. That is not allowed without a signed release. Photos published without a signed model release form can expose the publication that publishes those photos to civil liability cases, which means in practice that no legit publication or intermediary company using the photo for publication purposes, like an ad agency, will buy a photograph from a photographer who does not have a model release for the folks in the photos. It's just not worth the possibility of a lawsuit. Now do note that it is the publication of a photograph that is illegal without a model release, except in specific cases, not the taking of a photograph that is illegal. In many countries, you could walk right up to me in a public place and snap a photo, and as long as you do not use that photo to promote anything, or put it on a poster that you intend to then turn around and sell, there's not a lot that I can do about it. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today. But more specifically, I want to discuss how other people taking photos of us and sharing those photos, along with other information about us, can at times be both deleterious to us and incredibly difficult to productively talk about. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. You can also contribute monetarily via PayPal or Venmo apps like that. You can find links to those options at letsnotethings.com. And also super helpful is leaving a quick review up on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Those reviews make a bigger difference than you might suspect, and it only takes a moment. If you are enjoying the show, I would very much appreciate you taking that moment. A huge thanks to everybody who has already left a review or contributed in some other way. I truly appreciate that. That means a lot. All right, let's get back to the show. I have long considered myself to be quite lucky to have grown up in a technological bridge generation. I remember a time before the internet, before it was available to non-researchers, non-academics, and other plebes anyway. Before the web and before the browsers and all of that, I remember that time. But I was also young enough when the internet arrived with all its myriad public trappings that the technology has always felt very natural and intuitive to me. That sense of being a digital native combined with a sense of how incredible it all is. Because I got a chance to use the very early technology and hands-on understand how impressive the innovations that have been made since then have been and at what a rapid pace those innovations have arrived. I also come from an age group that came of age at precisely the right moment to start using social media pretty much as soon as it was introduced. But I was also old enough by the time that it became mainstream that a lot of my most embarrassing, awkward moments only ever show up on these platforms if I want them to. 
Facebook arrived at my university when I was midway through my time there. And that was when it was still limited to university students. So those early years were defined almost exclusively by a bunch of neophytes with social anxieties and embarrassing party photos slathered all across their profiles. We were free to flail and to fall and to learn and eventually build up our outward facing online presences into what they are now, more developed and often substantially more intentional versions of the same. For folks growing up today, though, things can be a little bit different. Contemporary teenagers face all kinds of dilemmas in their online life, torn between wanting to be real, wanting to be their true selves, to be free not to wear any kind of mask, not to brand themselves or sell themselves as something that they're not, or focus on any one part of themselves to the exclusion of all the others. But they are also aware that their Facebook profiles could be used against them, judged by potential future employers looking to weed out possible problem hires before they become their problem. Teenagers are more aware that these services are written in ink and that a deleted image is not really deleted. Alongside the messages that they share, the hashtags that they use, the dumb jokes that they make, all that stuff is there forever. And they are going through one of the most tumultuous periods of their lives in public. It's a very different experience growing up online today. The article that I want to start with comes from The Atlantic, and it's entitled, When Kids Realize Their Whole Life is Already Online. This piece gets into the complexities and conflicts that can arise when kids grow old enough to start using the internet, to maybe have their own accounts on social networks, and to bare minimum have the ability and know-how to search for themselves on Google. It's a strange perspective to think about, much less to investigate, but imagine how weird it might be to trundle along around the net only to find huge swaths of your life, complete with videos, photos, documentation of milestone moments, analysis of your behavior. They're all available online, presented with accompanying hashtags and captions posted by your parents, posted by your older siblings, by your school, your volleyball team, by your after-school bridge club. From there, imagine the perspective of the parent, someone who wants to share these vital moments in their children's lives, to document them for later revisitation, to share information with other parents, to learn from each other, and to collectively celebrate each other's victories and help out with each other's defeats. This has become such a thing, such a trend, that there's even a portmanteau term for it, sharenting, a concept that leads to children coming of internet age only to discover that from sonogram onward to the present day, they have been living kind of a Truman Show lifestyle with documentarians photographing and recording, producers cropping and retouching and applying filters, and an audience, large or small, soaking it all up, taking it all in, watching them and their lives like it's some kind of nature documentary or reality show. I remember years ago, when in my early 20s, some of my friends were beginning to get together and have kids, and the more tech-savvy among them were digitally cognizant enough to pick up their children's domain name, their .com address, ahead of time, before the kid was even born, ensuring that their child, when they grew up, would own their URL namesake, top-level designation, on the most important social platform of the time, the web. Now, though, rather than just an empty address, a piece of vacant real estate upon which they can build anything they want, some kids are inheriting mountains of media featuring their faces, their habits, their preferences and predispositions. Rather than being able to build whatever makes sense to them on that digital real estate as they get older and develop a sense of self, they may grow up to find that their parents have already built something there, something that makes sense according to their perception of their children. And though they may have the best of intentions in doing so, the outcomes are not always as positive as they may intend them to be. That's one version of this story, at least. Some of the children featured in this piece are actually disturbed by what they find and are trying to figure out ways to talk to their parents about it, to bring up their concerns. 
And alongside that, there are very public examples of parents taking things too far, becoming borderline or, obviously, exploitative in their pursuit of clicks and likes and advertising revenue for their YouTube channels, where their children serve as unwilling or unwitting props, in some cases required to behave appropriately so their parents can sell parenting ebooks or attract family-focused sponsors, or in some cases, serving as the targets of so-called practical jokes, which by many estimates, including law enforcement in some cases, was actually just colorfully enacted and recorded child abuse served up to an audience of accomplices. Other children, though, take to online fame, or at the very least online personhood, the feeling of being represented in this online space, quite enthusiastically. There are examples in this piece of kids discovering that they were in a photo that was published on a news website, and that got them so excited that they could not stop Googling themselves, wondering where they would show up next. Other kids in this piece were a little let down that they didn't have more evidence of their existence online, due in part to their parents' policy about not posting photos of their kids on the internet. To quote one 13-year-old from the article, quote, I don't want to live in a hole and only have two pics of me online. I want to be a person who is a person. I want people to know who I am, end quote. It's possible to hit an extreme on that end of the spectrum too, I think. Just as many adults become obsessed with their perceived clout or non-clout in the online world, it's possible for kids to take it personally if they don't seem to be liked or even known online despite all the people in their immediate vicinity seeming to think that they're okay. No Google necessary. The vast majority of kids, though, as tends to be the case with most things, are almost certainly somewhere in the middle, neither permanently scarred by this tendency nor thrilled by the discovery of their own hitherto unrecognized e-fame. But that general neutrality doesn't make it any less interesting a topic to watch because of the confluence of trends that this represents and because of the many elements of life today and tomorrow, potentially, that this touches on. There's another piece that was published recently that may at first seem to be taking us a little bit afield, but which I think addresses another important facet of this story and illustrates why that facet is important when we are considering these sorts of topics. This piece was published in Wired and was written by one of my favorite technology writers and one of the founding executive editors of Wired, actually, Kevin Kelly. This piece is entitled, AR Will Spark the Next Big Tech Platform. Call it Mirror World. The AR in that headline stands for Augmented Reality. And this mirror world concept is predicated on the idea that AR's real power will be realized when we begin to replicate the real world in the digital world. And Kelly argues that, in fact, we've already begun to do this in many ways. Now, this mirror world in practice will take the shape of a one-to-one -one digital replication of reality. You can already sort of walk the streets of many cities and many countries around the world because of Google Street View. But the mirror world experience would allow you to overlay a digital version of the real world onto the real world, allowing you to add metadata to that digital projection. So your neighborhood in real life would have a digital copy of itself, which you could use to tag historical information, which would then be available to people walking through the real world neighborhood. It would pop up on their smart glasses or phones or whatever else they're using to tap into that layer of reality. You can make multiple versions of this AR reality, multiple mirror worlds, and each one could provide different types of information about the real world. Some of them could have historical information. Some of them could contain different types of art that you make as graffiti on the walls that only show up when you view the world through those smart glasses and look at that particular AR layer. Importantly, this sort of thing already kind of exists in various shapes and sizes, in various industries and locations, but better devices for its consumption will be required before it hits the mainstream, and better ways to use what's called SLAM, S-L-A-M, which stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping, will be required. SLAM is what allows you to say this geolocation, this exact coordinate, correlates with this collection of information this graphic, this data about something that happened in this exact spot historically. If we can tie more digital information to more real-life locations, then we will have ourselves a rudimentary mirror world. 
fundamental to this concept, though, is that realization that even before we have the means to arrange this info in this way, making it available through AR devices, based on particular geotags, different locations that you can be in the world, we are already building this world. We are creating the raw materials of this world just by doing things online today, uploading photos, writing comments, chatting with each other, and so on. Because all of that information that is available on the internet today, it will all be tagged and organized and tethered to other information. That makes the info more useful and puts it in new contexts, which can lead to potentially incredibly novel and currently unimagined use cases, but also potentially some very awkward situations. Early examples of what I mean by this can be seen in Facebook's effort to map and track faces in photographs, which can unearth photos of you that you did not realize were somewhere online. The Facebook network can find these photos and let us know that they are out there swimming around in the online world, which can be very cool or very alarming, depending probably on how good you happen to look in that photo and how that photo is presented to you and to others. If it's presented in secret just to you, that's one thing. If it's automatically posted to your profile, or if you are automatically identified in that photo elsewhere, on other pages, on other people's profiles, that is a different thing entirely. The possibilities are immense here, but the potential for accidental harm is quite real. Which brings us back to that piece in The Atlantic about sharenting. Each of us will have our own mirror world doubles, just like real life locations do. And those doubles will serve as our online persona, our stand-ins in the digital world. They will be defined by all the information available about us, including the videos and photos that have been posted, information about the places that we've visited, the things that we've done, the work that we've created, the relationships that we have had. All of that information can be aggregated and used to create incredibly complex profiles of us. And this, too, is something that is already happening to a limited degree. We already have our online persona. Some of us have persona that are more controlled and intentional than others, but this online avatar is the version of ourselves that we present to the world in the online medium. And it is defined by what we choose to share and what we choose not to share. It's an interpretation of our more complete selves. It's a shadow of the real-world version of us. And we pick and choose to show different things, to choose certain things that we have done while not presenting and sharing other things that we've done. We share certain types of data, certain types of media, in an effort to cultivate and curate a persona that we believe accurately reflects ourselves in a flattering way. All that other information that's out there, though, out there on the web, on different websites, in different databases all over the planet, can influence the shape of our online mirror world double as well. And that means that if there's someone else out there telling our story, sharing tons of media about us, writing about us, talking about us through their perceptual lens rather than ours, that can cause our mirror world double to look different to look in some ways more like their idea about who we are, what we stand for, what we believe, why we do what we do, rather than our idea of the same. It's possible for our parents then, well-meaning as they might be, to define us to the world, to elbow aside our definition of ourselves, and then without intending to, put their stand-in, their version of us, in our place, in this online space. And this is in a world, in a society, where these online personas are becoming more and more important to how we are perceived by others, who will hire us, how attractive or unattractive we seem, how influential we seem, how cool or smart or stylish or whatever else we seem. And the way we are presented in this space can in turn influence the way that we are treated by others. And that means that these avatars in the online world, these stand-ins for us, the shape they take, can influence how we feel about ourselves here in the real world. Through that lens, it makes sense then that we might want to control the way that we are portrayed online. What's available about us? What story that information and media seem to tell? 
Touching back on that piece in The Atlantic, some of the kids who were interviewed indicated that a big part of why they wanted their own social media accounts was so that they could reclaim that narrative power, could tell their own story, post their own photos of themselves, photos that they liked rather than those that their parents preferred. They wanted to define themselves for themselves in this online medium. Now, in some cases, giving kids that control seems to work for those who are given the reins in that way. In other cases, the responsibility seems to be a little bit overwhelming, leading to panic, to depression, to a sense of helplessness about the entire situation. We sometimes think of young people as being these tech wizards, these digital natives whose first words are emoji. But in a lot of cases, the initial toe dipping into the internet world is just so big, it's so much compared to what they're used to. The experience can make them backpedal and feel like they are nobodies who don't speak the language of the land. They're not famous, they don't have the decade of experience that their parents have, and the decade worth of followers and connections and experience with the lingo and the tools. So they're at a substantial disadvantage at that moment. A moment when they're also very vulnerable to things like bullying and depression brought on by a shift in early relationships. A shift that can be caused or amplified by this puberty-like evolution that some kids deal with more capably than others when they begin to move online and receive a bit of power over the shape their mirror version of themselves takes. I should mention, too, that all of this gets more complicated because of the tools that we are dealing with here and the amount of data these tools collect, and how they use that data. Kids are being tracked, their faces are being added to databases, they are being discovered in photos that they did not know they were in, and those photos are being surfaced, often without their full understanding or foreknowledge of where those photos are, who owns them, what they represent, who will see them, and so on. We might aspire to protect kids from the dangers of the online world, but in some cases, by neglecting to teach them what they need to know to navigate those waters when they finally dive into them, we may be setting them up for failure that they needn't experience. We may be skipping the bicycle training wheels and plopping them down onto the seat of a motorcycle and telling them to have at it, no helmet needed. And it may be that because so many of us are actually not great ourselves at using these tools, not in psychologically healthy, balanced ways anyway, and we are passing on bad habits and behaviors that only amplify the negative stuff that's already out there, rather than allowing that negative stuff to evolve away, replaced by, perhaps over time, something better. We have a collection of latent, ongoing conflicts of interests, we denizens of the online world. My desire to express myself online and define myself as I see fit may stomp all over your ability to do the same. If you are part of my life, if you happen to be in the background of a selfie that I snap, or if you are blinking in the group photo that I proudly post somewhere, there are efforts in place in some parts of the world that are meant to increase a person's ability to extract themselves from this system, from this cycle, if they choose to do so. Aspects of the GDPR in the European Union, for instance, illustrate one of the ways that this might be done, though it's important to note that there are plenty of downsides that come tandem with the ability to pull yourself from, for instance, Google's search results, or deny online services the ability to casually collect data from you. The potential for abuses by companies are very real and worth looking into and figuring out ways to limit, but so are some of the consequences of unintentionally well-meaning but heavy-handed legislation. It seems to me that in the meantime, as we figure out those regulations and legislation and that side of things, we might be best served by adjusting our personal expectations and ability to discuss these sorts of topics, rather than hoping that a government entity somewhere passes laws that are favorable to our personal preferences at some point. This might mean having tricky discussions with our loved ones. It might mean making personal decisions about which services to use and which ones to discard. It might mean figuring out more optimal ways, optimal for your personal ambitions at least, to use a particular service or platform. And that will almost certainly mean taking the time to figure out what the point of all of these efforts are to begin with. What is it that you hope to accomplish through these efforts? 
And are your behaviors related to these technologies helping or hindering you in that pursuit? It's also helpful, I think, to understand as completely as possible how these pieces fit together and how posting a photo of your child on the internet can impact your child's life immediately and 20 years from now, potentially. How that photo will, once posted, never go away and might infinitely be remixed by software that is attempting to derive new meaning, find new connections between all the media that we have ever generated as a species, and how we might utilize that fact, all of this churning and iterating and evolving that's happening in the background, to help us fulfill our own personal and interpersonal needs. How we might feed our own desire to define ourselves and share something of our lives without stepping on other people's ability to do the same. As I record this, I'm currently on tour around North America with a few other stops outside of the continent. If you're keen to come out and hear me speak live, you can find a complete list of those tour dates and get information about acquiring tickets at becomingtour.com. And if you're keen to see some of the things that I've written and published online in addition to this podcast that I produce and publish, you might consider checking out my blog at exilelifestyle.com or my advice column about life, which you can find at somethoughtsaboutliving.com. The platform that I'd like to recommend today is a product that is typically available for free if it's available in your area, and it's called Canopy with a K, K-A-N-O-P-Y. You can find it at canopy.com. And a lot of libraries in the United States, but also internationally. I couldn't find any information about how many countries it's in, but I know it's at least in the United States and Australia. So you might check and see if it's available in your neck of the woods. But Canopy is kind of like a Netflix, but with a whole lot of educational and documentary and children's programming. And it is typically available for free through your local public library. Now, even if your local library does not have a membership with Canopy that allows you to access it, chances are they have something like it. And even if not, I just highly recommend that you visit your local library. Libraries are amazing and wonderful. Librarians kick all kinds of ass. And chances are there are resources there that you are either not utilizing at all or underutilizing in some way. And it's definitely worth checking those resources out if you get the chance. But Canopy in particular is something that has caught my attention recently. I've been trying to catch up on Criterion Collection films. Film is something that I enjoy, but I am definitely not an expert on it, and I'm trying to watch more films that are considered to be critically acclaimed and celebrated for some reason, and the Criterion Collection is one example of that type of curation. And Canopy has a whole lot of Criterion Collection stuff in addition to all the documentaries and other content that they have available. So if that sounds interesting, if you're curious about that, you might check out Canopy, K-A-N-O-P-Y dot com and see if it is available in your neck of the woods. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com and you can find the show notes for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find out more about the tour that I'm currently on at becomingtour.com, and you can find my advice column about life at somethoughtsaboutliving.com. Feel free to reach out and say hello on your social network of choice. I am Colin Wright on Facebook, and at Colin is my name on pretty much every other network that you can imagine, though I am primarily active on Twitter and Instagram these days. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. Thank you.